Hello everyone and welcome back to Grockets OGTV. This is the GMAT edition. There are other editions if you are studying for other tests, but this is the GMAT one. If you're not studying for the GMAT, you can still listen if you'd like, but uh, the questions will be specific to that test. We're going through the 12th edition to the guide, the official guide to the exam. That's where OG comes from. OG stands for official guide. TV stands for the television-like nature of these broadcasts, even though it's not broadcast over the airwaves. And my name's Jim Jacobson. <clears throat> I am going through all the questions in the official guide, one by one, um, cover to cover, in order, no less. And so we are winding down the data sufficiency portion of the section of the book. Um, we left off last time with question number 155, and the questions are getting, I don't know if you noticed, the questions are getting a little bit harder as we go. I've been keeping a pace of more or less 14 questions per session, but I'm not sure... How many we will get done this time. So I may end a little bit early so that um, the number that we have left is split evenly between the next two sessions, just so you know. Anyway, so like I said, we left off with uh, number 155 on page 287, so we are still on page 287, and we are on question 156. And as always, um, answer choice A is that statement 1 is sufficient, answer choice B is that statement 2 is sufficient, C is that the two statements together are sufficient even though individually they are not sufficient, answer choice D is that either one is sufficient, and answer choice E is that neither one is sufficient even in conjunction. They are both sufficient, insufficient in every way possible. Alright, let's get going. Is, so no, number 156, is 5 to the k less than 1000? <clears throat> Is 5 to the k less than 1,000? Good question. So, of course, we would have to know something about the value of k in order to answer this question. And we can do a little prefiguring. You know, we can say, um, you know, 5 squared equals 25. 5 to the third is 5 times that, 125. Multiply that times 5. 5 to the fourth um, equals... Uh, 625 and 5 to the fifth. I'm kind of trying to get us over 1,000 because usually that's um, where where the where it gets interesting. Basically, well, we know that 5 times 600 is going to be something over 3,000, and actually it comes out to be 3,125. So we can just stop there. What well, the question is really asking then is 5 to the is k um, less than 5? basically, um, because five to, the, 5 to the fifth power is <clears throat> way over 1,000, um, and 5 to the fourth or is, is definitely under 1,000. So let's take a look at those statements. Let's see what we get. So statement one tells us that uh, 5 to the k plus 1 is greater than 3,000. Exponents do need to be your friends um, on uh, the GMAT, so um, this is a good exercise in that. One thing to remember is that when you are dividing exponents, you subtract them. So, you know, for example, x to the a over x to the b has to be the same base. Um, <clears throat> x to the a over x to the b is equal to x to the a minus b. So if we divide numerator and denominator by 5, which is a non-negative number, so we can divide both sides of an inequality by a positive integer like that. Um, 5 to the k plus 1, we end up subtracting, because, of course, 5 is 5 to the first power. Then it ends up just being 5 to the k is greater than 600, which tells us that k is at least 4. So k is... For, um, yeah, is uh, greater than or equal to 4 but it doesn't tell us the actual value. I mean, k could be 4 or 400. I'm not going to compute 5 to the 400th power, but let's just say it's probably pretty big, um, and certainly over 1,000. And the question is 5 to the k less than 1,000. So, um, and actually, uh, this is a good general rule. You know, if they're asking you if something is less than a number, if the statement is that something is more than a number, unless that narrows it down to a single number, that's usually not going to be sufficient. We need to know what something is less than in order to answer the question, usually. Or in conjunction, we would need a greater than this and less than this. 
Anyway, it's not statement one, so that rules out A and D. Statement two, we get five to the K minus one is equal to five to the K minus 500. Okay. And uh, so, you know, if we just actually put both of these things, let's just get the two Ks on the same side of the equation. So that basically involves subtracting five to the K, or actually, no, what we're gonna do is subtract five to the K minus one from each side. Let me erase that arrow. <laughs> um, subtract five to the K minus one and then add 500 to both sides. So it ends up being uh, five to the K minus five to the K minus one <clears throat> equals 500. Now, uh, because we did this little bit of prefiguring over here, we can already see that the difference between five to the third and five to the fourth is 500 numbers. You know, the difference is 500 between 625 and 125 it's 500, which suggests that, or tells us basically that five to the K is five to the fourth power right here. If, however, we hadn't done this helpful work in advance, we could have done this algebraically. Um, we can uh, divide out a five to the K of, we can factor out a five to the K. So this would end up being, you know, five to the K times, um, let's see, factor out a five to the K. Uh, oh, right, um, uh, one minus, um, one-fifth, because it would be k to the minus one would be all that would be left, and k to the, um, you know, k to the minus one equals one over k to the one. That's how negative exponents work. They're not actually negative numbers. They're fractions. Um, <clears throat> so it would be that equals 500, 5 to the k times uh, one minus one-fifth is, of course, four-fifths equals 500. And then we would divide both sides by four fifths, or multiply both sides by five fourths, which is the same thing. Um, five to the k equals five fourths of five hundred, which of course five to the k equals six twenty five, which is the same answer that we arrived at when we looked at this and got that. So statement two is sufficient for us to answer: Is five to the k less than one thousand? It is. It is. 375 less than 1,000. Answer choice B, statement two, is sufficient on its own. Still page 287, and question number 157. As always, I write these down the side. So the hypotenuse of a right triangle is 10 centimeters. What is the perimeter in centimeters of the triangle? So we don't need a figure, but it doesn't hurt. So we have hypotenuse of a right triangle, right triangle, hypotenuse is the long side. Um, what is the perimeter? So we'll just use the base and the height of the triangle. And we would know, for example, that the area of the triangle would be one half the base times the height equals um, the area. And we also would know that b squared plus h squared equals the hypotenuse squared, 10 squared. So b squared plus h squared equals 100. So let's see what we get. Um, from our statements. Statement one tells us that the area of the triangle is 25 square centimeters. So this we can use the area formula. Um, one half the base times the height equals 25. So we know that the base times the height equals 50. And then we also know um, that if we were to kind of divide out this phrase here, or this expression, if the base times the height, base squared times the uh, height squared um, equals 100. Sorry, I'm just reminding myself how I did this. Um, Hmm. 
Hmm. Well, well, what we're looking for is the perimeter here, so um, which is the base plus the height plus 10 equals the perimeter. And how did I do that? I honestly don't remember what I what I was doing with this one. This is not good for a international web broadcast. What the heck was I thinking? Hmm. Let me see if writing down what I have here in the notes makes reminds me at all. So So we have, uh, so I mean, um, I'm, what I'm using in my notes here is the, um, the idea that, you know, x plus y quantity squared equals um, x squared plus 2xy plus uh, y squared, and then replacing this with the base times the height. And, oh, I think that's exactly what I was doing. Okay, right, 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 right. I see what I was doing. So using this as a principle, um, using that any you know x plus y quantity squared, we can actually get things that look like this from the information that we're given, and from there reverse engineer what uh, base plus height is. So, for example, um, this this expression here, so x plus y quantity squared, is the same thing. If we, I mean, normally when you're factoring these things, this is the order that you put things in, but it's also the same thing as um, well. So let's put it in. The familiar terms. So the base plus the height quantity squared, um, which isn't something we don't we don't have this. This is what we're trying to find out. But this would equal uh, b squared uh, plus two b h um, plus um, uh, h squared. And we can reorder these. This is just a simple addition expression. So this would be the same thing as b squared plus h squared plus 2bh. So we just put them in a different order. And this is still the b squared plus the h, or b plus h quantity squared, which we don't know. Again, we don't know this. But we do know, this is all coming back to me now, um, we do know what these guys are. Um, we know what b plus h, b squared plus h squared is. We actually have that right here. So we know that this is 100. And we also know what base times the height is, bh equals 50 from what we found out from the area. So if bh equals 50, 2bh equals 100. So by um, pretending to create this b squared plus 2bh plus h squared um, uh, expression, um, it actually produced two smaller expressions that we already had the information for. So we know that then b plus h quantity squared is um, equal to 200, so b plus h equals the square root of 200. And whatever that actually ends up being, we know that that, um, so the square root of 200 plus 10 equals the perimeter. So the question you're probably asking yourself is, how would we know that this is what we wanted to do? Because, again, <laughs> I had it in my notes and I had completely forgotten what I was doing there. So how would you know when you're doing this problem that that's an option for you? And this is that's where it really comes down to it. Perhaps if I had had my uh, workspace kind of organized a little bit differently here, recognizing what information you actually have and seeing whether that matches other patterns in, you know, of other algebraic patterns in your mind. Seeing that we had b squared plus h squared, seeing that we had bh, um, can can trigger in your mind this notion that, oh, hey, I, those are things that I kind of know how I could get those things. And so that would, um, your familiarity with um, basic binomial expressions, which is super important on the GMAT, um, would trigger the memory that, hey, you know, I wonder if I could actually, if I just add these two together, I have that, and that is b plus h quantity squared, and b plus h is something we're after. Anyway, so uh, 
I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, this statement and figuring that out is, it may actually be the biggest logical leap in the data sufficiency section of the, um, well, it's the big, it was the biggest logical leap for me, clearly, because I didn't even remember it from um, when I uh, was going over this last night. Anyway, good story. Statement one is sufficient. So um, that rules out answer choice B, uh, C, and E. Let's see what we get from statement two. Statement two tells us, what does it tell us? The two legs of the triangle are of equal length. So that tells us that B equals H. And so in this case, so um, one of the reasons originally that um, statement one looked insufficient, B times H equals 50, there are multiple values for B and H that when multiplied together give you 50. Not so much when the two are equal. And of course we can't use uh, base times height equals 50 because that's from statement one. We have to ignore statement one when we do statement two. Um, however, we do still have the Pythagorean theorem. We have, you know, b squared plus h squared equals 100, but this is really the same thing as b squared plus b squared equals 100, which is 2b squared equals 100. So um, that gives us then b squared equals um, 50, so b equals the square root of 50. So the perimeter will be 2 times the square root of 50, one, one for the base, one for the height, plus 10. Which, and the square root of 50 is, of course, uh, 5 times the square root of 2. So this is really 10 plus 10 times the square root of 2. Not that we were supposed to solve it, but I did anyway. So this one's a little bit more straightforward and also sufficient, so it's answer choice D. So I guess the, you know, the lesson to be learned with some of these higher end uh, data sufficiency questions is um, learn to recognize when the information has given you um, parts of expressions that look familiar from other bits of algebra in particular that you've had to memorize or just internalize depending on how you went about learning it. Some of you may have it burned into your brain by the end of the time you study. Anyway, answer choice D for question number 157. Uh, 287, question number 158. Every member of a certain club volunteers to contribute equally to the purchase of a $60 gift certificate. How many members does the club have? So um, everyone volunteers to contribute equally. So if we divide um, $60 by the number of members, that equals their contribution. So if we can find the contribution, total contribution, um, or, sorry, this isn't the total contribution, this is the um, individual contribution. So if we find the individual contribution, we will have sufficiency. Let's see what we get. We get statement one. Statement one tells us that each member's contribution is to be $4. And that's actually exactly what we were after. So we know that 60 divided by M equals Four, um, and so we can multiply both sides by four and divide both sides by m. That's the same thing as 60 divided by four equals m, and so m equals 15. There are 15 members, so that is clearly sufficient. It's not uh, answer choice B, C, or E. We now have a 50% chance of getting this question right just on the basis of figuring that one out. Statement two. Um, if five club members fail to contribute, the share of each contributing member will increase by $2. So it doesn't give us outright what each of the contributions need to be. However, it is going to give us a second distinct linear equation. And of course, when you have two equations and two variables, it's going to be sufficient. We just need to make sure it is a distinct equation. Although, I mean, really, how could it not be? Um, this one tells us that the $60 divided by the number of members minus the five members who bail out because they suck or don't like the gift or don't like the person that it's giving, that is being given to. Um, so that equals uh, the contribution, the individual contribution that they each would have had to pay plus $2. So that's our new equation. Um, and so in conjunction with our previous equation of 
60 over m equals c. Um, and we can also, this one also tells us if we multiply both sides by m, we get cm equals 60, which is the individual contribution times the number of people equals the total contribution. We can actually figure it out from there. So with this one, um, I personally went about it differently from the way that they explained it in the official guide. I actually just went ahead and simplified this expression rather than you know doing working both of them simultaneously. So I did it and then I substituted. So multiply both sides times m plus 5. So that ends up being um, 60 equals uh, cm minus 5c plus 2m minus 10. But then, of course, finding out that um, because I have both values for c and cm, I just substituted those in. So 60 equals 60, because I have the value for cm, minus 5c. So 5c is 5 times 60 over m, which is 300 over m, plus 2m minus 10. And um, you know the 60s cancel out, subtract 60 from both sides. We get 0 equals minus 300 over m plus 2m minus 10. And then multiply the whole thing times m to get rid of this fraction. Um, you know, the 300 over m, let's get rid of the over m part. Multiply both sides of the equation by m. m times 0, the, the left-hand side of the equation is going to stay 0. Um, and reordering it a bit, so this is times m equals um, 0 equals um, 2m squared. That's the middle term, which is now the um, second order term. Um, plus 10m minus 300. We can factor out a 2. 0 equals 2 times m squared plus 5m minus 150. And then that equals 0 equals 2 times um, m minus 15 and m plus 10. Oh, it's the other way around. No, no, that's right. So um, m can either equal 15 or negative 10. And since we already know that we can't have negative numbers of people in a club, m equals 15 or negative 10. Oh, I see what my problem is. This should actually be um, minus 10m minus 5m. That's why I hesitated. I'm like, wait a minute, that should be m plus 15. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, clear. So m, m equals 15, and of course that matches what we came up with in statement one. That's how we also know that we're on the right track. So we can say statement two is sufficient. It is answer choice D. So 287, second column, question 159. If x is less than 0, is y greater than 0? And x is less than 0. Let's see. Not any figuring we can do in advance. Unlike, so, you know, clearly we have problems that can differ kind of wildly. Some of them uh, you can do a lot of figuring in advance, and then when you get to the questions, it is made easier. In other ones, um, there's nothing you can do until you get to the statements. So um, statement one tells us that x divided by y is less than zero, which tells us that x divided by y is a negative number. So, um, and we know that x is negative. The question is, is y greater than zero? Is y negative? If y is negative, then a negative divided by a negative equals a positive. It's uh, greater than zero. If y is positive, a positive, a negative divided by a positive is less than zero. And since x divided by y is less than zero, and we know that x is negative, y must be positive. So this is sufficient to tell us yes. 
because this is against the rules. So statement one is sufficient. We can cross off B, C, and E. Statement two, y minus x is greater than zero. And at first glance, it sounds like that would be positive, um, that y would also be greater than zero, because um, we know that x is negative from the original question. So y minus a negative number, which is the same thing as adding a positive number, that that is equal to zero, or excuse me, greater than zero. Um, However, we can actually choose multiple values for y that produce different results. So we can have, um, for example, y equals 2 and x equals negative 10. So y, or so y minus x equals 2 minus negative 10, which equals 12. But we can also have y equals negative 2 and x equals negative 10. y minus x equals uh, negative 2 minus negative 10, which equals 8. So even though y minus x is positive in both cases, we have one where y itself is um, greater than 0, so this is yes, and one where y is less than 0 and where this is no. So if, if a statement gives you results that are sometimes yes and sometimes no, it is not sufficient. So statement 2 is insufficient. It is not answer choice D. It is answer choice A. Still on 287, question number 160. What is the circumference of the circle above with center O? So we have our circle, which has little triangle action going on within it. So we have x, y is a point there, and z is a point here. And o is the origin. And this is a right angle. I know that's not the best circle in the world, but, you know, whatever. Um, what is the circumference of the circle? So remember the uh, formula for circumference. is uh, 2 times pi times the radius or pi times the diameter, since the diameter itself is 2 times the radius. So um, OX and OZ, since X and Z are both points on the circle, and since O is at the center, um, we know that OX equals OZ. And so each of those is a radius of the circle. If we're able to find either of those, we will have sufficiency um, yeah, that's, that's the likely place to start in terms of our predictions. There, just remember that with circles, if you find any bit of information, you can usually find out all the other bits of information about a circle because they're all interrelated. So let's see what we get. Statement 1 tells us the perimeter of triangle OXZ is 20 plus 10 times the square root of 2. Okay, so, um, so triangle... O, X, Z, perimeter equals 20 plus 10 times the square root of 2. Um, so you can get at this one by uh, uh, two different ways. So when you have a triangle like this, we know that O, X equals O, Z because they're each a radius of the circle. So this is a, um, an isosceles triangle. Two of the side lengths are the same, so we'll call this one r and this one r because they're both the radius of our circle, o, x, z. Um, and so one thing you could say is that, and this is the shortcut, it is worth your time to remember um, the relationships of, for example, 45, 45, 90 triangles, um, where those are the angle measures. So a triangle whose angles measure two angles measuring 45 degrees and one measuring 90. Um, that actually makes life, you know, easier because the uh, ratios of those sides is x to x, come on, to x times the square root of 2. And that's true for all 45, 45, 90 triangles. If you're given one of those three values and you know the angle measures of the triangle, you can figure out the other two. Um, 
by proportion because it's a it's a ratio. So we know immediately that um, the ratios of the sides here are you know r plus r plus r times the square root of two, and that's clearly r equals ten, and um, therefore the uh, two pi r is going to be twenty pi. If you don't remember these guys, just know that they are derived by the Pythagorean theorem. So um, we find out here that um, you know r squared plus r squared. Well, well we know that, um, that that basically, if you have two sides and then you have the third side, that's what that's where um, r squared plus r squared. You know, so a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Pythagorean's theorem, and then that's basically taking the, um, the square root of um, two times that side length. So, you know, c equals the square root of a squared plus b squared, and we know that um, a and b are equal, so c equals the square root of two times the side squared. Um, which is called b squared, and then you can remember that uh, the square root of x times y equals the square root of x times the square root of y. So then that's um, c equals square root of 2 times the square root of b squared, and c equals b times the square root of 2. So that's where they get this uh, ratio of x to x to x times the square root of 2. It's simply a reduction of the Pythagorean theorem. And so if you don't remember these uh, side, triangle side things, you can also just get there via the Pythagorean theorem. And using this exact same method, you would realize that um, the third side of this triangle equals um, the radius times the square root of 2, and from there you could solve the rest. So um, Obviously, this is the shortcut that makes your life easier. So I think these are totally worth memorizing. Anyway, statement one is sufficient because from that we were able to figure out um, the perimeter of the circle. So, or circumference, excuse me. Well, circumference is perimeter. We just call it something different for circles. So it's not uh, statement two on its own, and it is not... Um, either of the statements that involve statement one being insufficient. Statement two for this problem, the length of arc x, y, z is five pi. So I'm just gonna fill this in on our drawing since we don't need it for statement one anymore. So this thing here is five pi. And this is one of the neat things about the properties of circles. If you know the uh, measure of the angle that generates an arc, um, you know what percent or what fraction of the overall circumference that arc length is. So because this is a right angle here, um, you know, it's a 90 degree angle out of a possible 360 degrees, I made my degree sign too soon, out of a three, possible 360 degrees for the circle. So um, a right angle is one quarter of the overall circle's angle-ness. <laughs> um, it's one quarter of the circle, we'll go with that, which means in turn that the arc of 5 pi is one quarter of the total circumference. So um, 5 over pi is to the total circumference what 1 is to 4. I mean, I'm writing all this out algebraically. You can already see that the circumference equals 20 pi, which matches what we came up with uh, for statement 1, but that's always good news to see that that happens. And of course, you will get problems on the GMAT, or excuse me, can get problems in the GMAT and in your practice, again, not necessarily on the real test, where it's not such a clear-cut thing, where maybe they don't give you 90 degrees, maybe they give you 60 degrees, maybe they give you 45, maybe they give you 30. Um, so the proportion may not be something that you can instantly say, oh, well, clearly that's a quarter of the circle. So just be prepared to set it up as a proportion, or they could give, you, uh, give it to you algebraically. So um, be prepared for things harder than 90 degrees. Anyway, statement two is sufficient. It tells us the circumference is 20 pi also, so uh, answer choice D, either statement is sufficient on its own. These problems are definitely taking longer than I, you, than I, even I had um, anticipated. 
So page 287, question number um, 161. Wow, this one's a long story. So beginning in January of last year, Carl made deposits of $120 into his account on the 15th of each month for several consecutive months, and then made withdrawals of $50 from the account on the 15th of each of the remaining months of last year. There were no other transactions in the account last year. If the closing balance of Carl's account for May of last year was $2,600, what was the range of the monthly closing balances of Carl's account last year? So in order to answer this question, we basically, so we know that Carl is, you know, adding $120 each month for a while. And then he's also subtracting $50 each month for a while. So to know the range of his monthly balances, we basically need to know what month did he stop adding, you know, what was the high point of his account, and then go backwards from there to either end of the year to see whether the beginning or end of the year, what, which one was the low point, and then that's the range of his monthly values. So, you know, his account is going to look something like, you know, up, 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 down, 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 down. Now, depending on when he... Um, and yes, I did have to give those sound effects, apparently. Anyway, so depending on when he starts um, going from deposits to withdrawals, his account may be you know, up, down for the whole year, or it could be up for most of the year, and then only in, at the end he does that. And, and so until we know where in the year, this represents a year in all these cases, depending, so depending on where the giving stops and the taking begins, uh, that will definitely impact the range of his values. All we know for sure is that in May he had $2,600. That's all we know for now, of course, because we are about to look at these statements. Let's see what it tells us. So statement one, last year the closing balance of Carl's account for April was less than $2,625. Okay. So, um, so April was um, less than 2625 which means basically that um, his account was still going up in May. He was still depositing. Um, in order for his account to have been going down in May, like if May were the month where he started to withdraw, April would have needed to be 2650. So this is April. Um, minus $50 equals 2600. That gives us May. Or, um, so uh, April would have had to have been higher for him to have subtracted 50 in May and have 2,600 at the end of the month, which means that basically um, April had to have been $120 less. So um, April actually equaled 2,480 plus 120 equals 2,600. So, um, the moral of the story here is that his account is still going up in May. And knowing that it's still going up in May doesn't tell us about the range of the values because we don't know when he starts making withdrawals. It could be something like this here, it could be like uh, picture number one, or it could be like picture number three. So maybe he stops mid-year, maybe he stops making deposits in November and only withdraws for one month. If we don't know when that happened, it's not going to be sufficient. So statement one is insufficient. We can cross off A and D. Does that make sense? Of course, I can't see whether you're nodding or even talking to the screen right now. Um, that his April value would have had to have been higher than what statement one told us in order for him to have subtracted 50 and gotten 2,600 from A. April would have had to have been 2,650, but we know that it was less than 26 or 2,625. So um, April was a deposit month rather than a withdrawal month, as was May. 
Statement two, last year the closing balance of Carl's account for June was less than 2,675. So June was less than 2,675. And so again, we take our month before, which is 2,600. If, um, if he were adding, if he were making a deposit in June, plus another 120, that would equal 2720, which we see is actually not possible. June was less than 2675. So June cannot have been a month where he um, made a deposit because it's actually lower than what it should be based on what we know about May. So this is May here. Whereas if um, you know if he if he went down from May minus fifty, his June balance would be twenty five fifty, which is less than twenty six seventy five. So clearly June is when he starts. It's it's not when he it's not when he starts making withdrawals. Um, but clearly he is making withdrawals in June. But since we're looking at statement two on its own only, we don't know when he started making withdrawals. Um, or you know when when yeah when when he when he stopped making deposits and started making withdrawals. Basically, the same problem that we had with statement one. Um, we don't know whether he started making withdrawals very early, um, or whether it's just in June. So um, statement one was you know in terms of my little graphs, it was one or three. Um, statement two gives us one or two for our options. And again, without knowing which one, we won't know the range of values for his monthly balance. Statement two is insufficient as well, so it's not statement, it's not answer choice B. In conjunction though, we basically do get what we need. We know that, um, you know, in terms of April, May, and June, we know that in April, he, um, Carl added 120, and we know that in May, he added 120, and in June, he did not add 120, because it, it doesn't fit with the information we had, so June, is when he starts making his withdrawals. Um, I'm putting this box here to make it clear that this is the two statements together, um, which gives us something uh, like the drawing or the graph in number one. And uh, from here, knowing what he got in May and knowing that at the end of May he had 2,600, we could just subtract $50 for each of the months until the end of the year, figure out what that balance is, and his range would be the difference between May and December. That would equal the range. I don't want to figure it out. You can if you want in your spare time. Um, yeah, so the two statements together are sufficient, which gives us answer choice C. So page 287, uh, that's an eight. 287, question number 162. If n and k are positive integers, is the square root of the quantity n plus k greater than 2 times the square root of n? So is n plus k greater than 2 times the square root of n? So um, we can do a little simplifying and a little figuring here. Oh, that's supposed to be a greater than, not an equal. We can square both sides. Um, and so the square root of the quantity n plus k squared equals um, n plus k. Um, so this is really asking us is is n plus k. And remember, um, you know, since we're multiplying both sides, remember that uh, square root signs, the radical sign is always the positive square root. So we don't have to worry about whether we're multiplying or dividing by a negative number here. So um, n plus k, is n plus k greater than, um, and of course, uh, you know, 2 times the square root of n squared is 2 squared times square root of n squared, or 4n, and we can subtract an n from both sides, so really what we want to know is, is um, k greater than 3n? If it is, the square root of the quantity n plus k will be greater than 2 times the square root of n. 
statement time. Statements give us your information. Statement one tells us that k is greater than 3n. Wow! Exclamation point to answer our to answer our question mark here. So that clearly is sufficient. That's exactly what we figured out that we would be looking for. So we can cross off b, c, and e. Statement two. We have n plus k is greater than 3n. And unfortunately, without knowing the relative values of n and k, we can actually come up with more than one answer. So, um, so n plus k is greater than 3n. So let's just say n equals 1 and k equals um, oh, 3. So if n equals 1 and k equals 3, n plus k equals 4, and 3n equals 3. So um, n plus k is 4, um, and uh, is greater than 3. But in this case, um, k is not greater than 3n. Um, 3 equals 3, k and 3n. So we meet the conditions, 4 equals 3. But then, the, in terms of the question, is k greater than 3n? The answer is no. Whereas if we choose n equals 1 and k equals 4 even, um, n plus k is 5, greater than 3n, which is 3. So that meets our conditions. And then n plus, or, uh, is k greater than 3n? 4 is greater than 3. And the answer is yes. So depending on our values for n and k, really are depending on our values for k, um, the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no to the question, is k greater than 3n? So because we can get different answers depending on what numbers we pick, statement 2 is insufficient, meaning that statement 1 alone is enough for our purposes. Page 287, question number 163. In a certain business, production index P is directly proportional to efficiency index E, which is in turn directly proportional to investment index I. What is P if I equals 70? So we know that these guys form a ratio, P to E to I. They're all directly proportional, which means they will all increase proportionally. They do not necessarily increase at a one-to-one -one proportion. Um, but they increase at regular rates. And so they all would have a, an interrelationship with each other if we can find out those interrelationships. And we want P, really we're only after P to I. And really we're after P to 70. So in order to have sufficiency on this one, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, in order to have sufficiency, we need um, an answer choice that gives us the relationship between P and I in some form. Statement 1 tells us that E equals 0.5 um, when I equals 60. So this would give us the relationship of E to I. But p is not in this equation at all. And so even, we, even, that, even though we know that p is directly proportional to e, we don't know what that proportion is. And so no p. There's no p for statement 1. That makes it insufficient because p is what the question is actually asking. So it's not answer choice A, nor is it answer choice D. Statement 2, p equals 2.0 when i equals 50. So that gives us a relationship between p and i. We can say that, you know, that 2.0 to i is 50 equals x, or even better yet, p. Oh, don't scribble, Jim. Just erase it there. Um, p is 270. So then it's a proportion, um, you know, 50p equals 140p equals 2.8, which is great. But we didn't actually have to solve that. Just know that it does come out OK. Um, 
that is sufficient, we can cross off uh, answer choices C and E, which re required both statements to be insufficient initially. Answer choice B is the correct one. And it looks like we're going to finish right around where I thought we were going to finish. I thought we would not get as many done today. Or really, I thought I would not get as many done today. You would probably go faster on your own, but of course, um, I have to explain a lot of things that in doing them, if I were doing them on my own, I wouldn't have to explain. Question number 164. In the rectangular coordinate system, are the points R and S and U and V equidistant from the origin? Right. So, distance formula. So the distance between um, two points is um, the square root, and that's a long one, of the um, difference in the x points plus the difference in the y points. That's the distance formula. Um, and of course, when the point of origin is the origin, point zero, zero, you know, zero comma zero, the dot in the middle of the Cartesian coordinate system, um, one of these x's and one of these y's is zero. If you make it the second one, then the, so distance from origin, slightly easier. Um, it's just x, oh, whoops, forgot to square those. Um, just x squared plus y squared, which is great. If you don't remember the distance formula, you can re-derive it. Again, this is one of those applications of the Pythagorean theorem. Um, and we'll just use the origin point as an example, but basically the distance formula is creating a triangle. So if we're trying to find the distance from the origin to here, we are creating a triangle. Um, this is the change in x values, you know, um, x2 minus x1, and then these are the y values, or y1 minus, I did the, the numbers wrong. Anyway, it comes out to be the same. That's actually why you're doing the square root of these things squared, so that even if you end up with negative numbers, uh, distances all become positive. That's what the, the radical sign is doing for you. Um, uh, y1 and y2. Anyway, um, the distance then is, you know, x squared plus y squared equals c squared, the, the distance right here. So um, if you didn't remember the distance formula or just had never heard of it, using the Pythagorean theorem on this problem will also work. But it's still a mouthful. So statement one tells us r plus s equals one. It doesn't tell us anything about u or v, the other point that we're comparing it to, so clearly this is going to be insufficient. We need both points to figure things out. So it's not answer choice A, nor is it answer choice D. Statement two, um, we get u equals one minus r, and uh, v equals 1 minus s. And yeah, so we can still do some things. And remember, um, for in figuring out our distance from the origin, we're going to need each of these squared. So if we square what u equals, um, so, you know, u squared equals, you know, 1 minus r quantity squared. Um, which is um, 1 minus 2r plus r squared. And v, we can square this guy too, so v squared equals 1 minus s, quantity squared. And that one's going to be v squared equals, that's an equal sign over here, not a less than. Um, 1 minus 2s plus s squared. And so u squared plus v squared is going to equal the two of those things together, which is 2 minus 2 times the uh, quantity r plus s. This is basically accounting for these two middle terms here minus 2r minus 2s is the same thing as minus 2 times r plus s. 
um, plus r squared plus s squared. And so remember, we're, we're wondering whether both of these things have the same distance. So if each of them, we're wondering basically, is the square root of r squared plus s squared, using the distance formula there, is it equal to the square root of the distance of u squared plus v squared? We can get rid of the square roots. Um, so the question is really asking, is r squared plus s squared equal to u squared plus v squared? That's what we're actually asking. Um, and this, figuring this out actually gets us close to there. And that's how you know we knew that we were on the right track, is that we actually have u squared plus v squared on the one side, and we have r squared plus s squared on the other side. But we still don't know what the value of this junk in the middle is. Um, so statement two on its own isn't going to be sufficient because we don't know the values of r plus s. Statement two is insufficient. It's not answer choice B. However, in conjunction, remember that statement one actually gave us the value of r plus s. r plus s equals one. So this stuff, this extra stuff that's getting in the way of us figuring out um, whether the statement is sufficient or whether the two are sufficient, two minus two times, and remember r plus s equals one, two minus two equals zero. So this whole thing gets canceled out and we end up with u squared plus v squared equals r squared plus s squared which is sufficient. So the two statements together are sufficient. And based on the time, I don't think I'm going to get through the next question. So I'm going to stop here rather than finishing part way through. That'll give us one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Another ten questions to do next time. I'll try to move a little bit faster. I think we only got nine done this time. Um, but these do get trickier as we go, you know, as you may have noticed in this section of the OG. So. Anyway, um, thanks for joining me. My name is Jim Jacobson, like it says up there. You've been watching Grocket's OG TV, the GMAT edition. Tomorrow we will finish, well, it's tomorrow if you're watching live broadcasts. It may be, you know, uh, 30 seconds from now if you're watching these recorded. And um, tomorrow, for me and for some of you, we will get through the remaining, remaining data sufficiency questions. And from then, we will move uh, on to the verbal section. Reading comprehension is up next. So... Thanks for joining me, and I will see you next time.